Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us to the second uh, virtual DOE Office of Indian Energy Program Review. Um, this is the 11th, I think, um, for the Office of Indian Energy, and unfortunately, we couldn't be here together uh, in person this year. We hope to next year. Um, obviously, there's a lot of magic that happens, and I'm sure that uh, I know everybody misses the in-person meeting. So next slide, please. So for those um, on the line that I may have not met yet, um, my name is Lizana Pierce. Um, I've been in the energy development uh, space for about 25 plus years, um, and I just aged myself, I know. But uh, I have had the pleasure and the privilege of working with Indian tribes, Alaska villages, and Native communities. Uh, for over 20 years now. Um, by way of introduction, I'm a mechanical engineer by degree and in my current position as the deployment supervisor for the office, I support uh, the deployment program, which is comprised of financial assistance on a competitive basis. Um, and though you'll hear presentations in this session and for the next couple of days on those, so we do offer technical assistance at uh, no cost uh, to tribes and eligible tribal entities, which includes providing um, advice and subject matter expert support uh, to you for your projects or for energy planning. Uh, we also have an education and outreach component. Um, additionally, I manage the national funding opportunity announcements, and I've acted as project officer for many, many projects over the years. On the um, outreach and education includes uh, the website, um, email newsletters, uh, webinars, workshops, um, and I also oversee the laboratory support and that of our uh, technical assistance providers network. So again, thank you for joining us. Uh, next slide, please. So before we jump into the project presentations, I um, wanted to go over some event details. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the DOE's Office of Indian Energy website in a couple of weeks. Copies of the slides will also be posted on the website and everyone will receive the post-event email with the link uh, where those will be uh, posted. Because we are recording this webinar, all phones have been muted. Um, however, you can submit a question in the question box on the control panel at any time, and uh, we will take those questions at the end of the final presentation during the session. And for the presenters, you know, please stay muted when you're not presenting, and um, I think we have plenty of time, so that should not be an issue either. Okay, so I'm going to um, give the floor to Josh, who is uh, a recent um, hire and joined our group, and I'll let him introduce himself. Josh. Thanks, Lizana. Welcome, everyone, to session seven of the 2021 Virtual DOE Office of Indian Energy Program Review. I'm Josh Gregory. I'm a recent addition to the Office of Indian Energy, having had the privilege of joining the team this September, actually, as a project officer and engineer. Uh, before joining the group, I worked with the Bureau of Indian Affairs Division of Energy and Mineral Development. I was there for the past six years as a mechanical engineer in their renewable energy branch, and I worked with tribes on energy development planning and identifying sustainable energy development options through their tribal energy grant programs there. Uh, it really is an honor to be a part of the Indian Energy Group and certainly to be able to continue working with these great nations, villages, and communities on something as crucial as energy development. So thanks for having me. Uh, okay, let's get on to the good stuff. Next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, so the program review is a reporting requirement for all grant recipients of DOE Office of Indian Energy funding, and it's really intended to provide annual project updates, to share successes and lessons learned, and as many of you know, it's a great opportunity to network when in person. Uh, me personally, fingers crossed for next year. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. To start session seven off, we're going to hear from Josh Simmons of Prosper Sustainably, who will be presenting on two projects of the Rincon Band of Luceno Indians of California, 
First, we're going to hear about the Rincon Solar Microgrid project, and then Josh will follow that up with details on the Rincon Government Center Microgrid project. Next, John Flores, Environmental Director with the San Pasqual Band of Mission Indians of California, will be discussing two of the San Pasqual Band's projects, uh, their active microgrid project and the newly awarded Community Solar Project. After we hear from Josh and John about these great projects, we'll open it up to Q&A to round out session seven. And Josh and John, since both of you are doing back-to-back -back presentations, uh, I'll give you a, a time reminder if even necessary, uh, if you start going way over, or you may see a chat reminder pop up. Okay, Josh, if you're ready, it's all yours. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you so much, Josh. Welcome. That's uh, you know good to see some fresh blood in the Office of Indian Energy, and uh, you know I think it's a lot of money and a lot of great support coming out of your office. So I just appreciate uh, all, all Zana, Josh, and the rest of your team do uh, in supporting tribes and, and these exciting projects. So uh, this is actually going to be a single presentation for both the um, all of Rincon solar microgrid projects, so the government center and uh, as well as the resort area and fire station uh, microgrid projects as well. Um, uh, so there, there's certainly an interrelationship between all of them and I'm excited to get going. I am Josh Simmons with Prosper Sustainably. I am the technical contact for Rincon on these projects, uh, kind of lead project manager, owner's engineer, representative. I'm not an engineer myself, I'm a, uh, an attorney, but we have engineers working in our team supporting this project as well. And just excited to be here and grateful to be here and hope to also be in person next year as well. So next slide, please. Uh, so the Rincon Reservation was established in 1875, located in Southern California, Northeast San Diego County, fairly close to, to San Pasqual uh, for John and his presentation next. Um, so they have uh, approximately 5,000 acres of land within the San Luis Rey River watershed. Uh, the reservation is a considered rural area of an uh, a rural area of an incorporated north central San Diego County, although, you know, certainly the, the, the Tripass Trust lands, uh, so that 5,000 acres is in trust uh, and includes a broad range of wildlife species and, and vegetation communities. Next slide. There are approximately 1,800 residents and uh, various businesses th scattered throughout the reservation, which include uh, Harrah's Resort, Southern California, a over 1,000 room, two-story, 21, two and two 21-story hotel towers, includes an event center, a gaming casino, and eight, eight restaurants that may need to be updated, a uh, spa and um, parking for the uh, visitors. The uh, historic and current land uses around the reservation are agricultural, residential, gaming, along with some uh, light industrial. Next slide, please. So some of the past activities that are relevant that the tribe have been engaged in are they installed, I believe, in around 2010, one megawatts of solar to, to for Harris Resort. Uh, they have also installed, I believe, in latter half of 2018, early 2019, a lithium ion uh, leased battery, leased by STEM, uh, that to for demand charge reduction and energy arbitrage for cost saving purposes uh, 2018. Uh, they've implemented extensive energy efficiency measures uh, throughout the resort. Um, in 2019, the tribe most recently updated its strategic energy and resiliency plan and electric vehicle charging stations are installed throughout the reservation. Uh, most can be found at the government center and over at the resort. Next slide, please. So for these uh, Rincon solar microgrid projects, the first and foremost driver behind these uh, motivation for the tribe behind these projects was increasing resilience. Uh, the tribe, um, among a lot of tribes in California, are experiencing an increasing number of public safety power shutoff events that are uh, being initiated by the utility in order to reduce wildfire risk. So uh, the utilities in and days of high heat and or uh, when the winds pick up um, in rural areas where there is vegetation, they're actually de-energizing the grid uh, on circuits that 
uh, are in these vegetated areas to reduce the risk of sparks creating wildfires. And these PSPS outages are can occur from as you know as few as maybe you know hours to days and even weeks. Uh, get up in Northern California and they're experiencing. PSPS events that are lasting sometimes weeks. Uh, Rincon, I think the longest one they've experienced has been three days, uh, but you know, even a, a day long, two, two day long, I mean, it shuts down, shuts down the entire reservation, it shuts down the government center, their, their, their fire station. I mean, they, they have backup generators uh, on a lot of these, but they're limited by how much fuel that they have available for those generators and uh, it shuts down the, their critical economic driver, the, the Harris resort and all the also emergency and other benefits that uh, that facility provides to the community as, as well. Um, so, you know, first and foremost, increasing resilience for the, these critical facilities throughout the, the community. And I'll go into more detail of what, what are kind of all, all the various assets, including with, within the microgrids that we're working on. Uh, a close second behind that is also seeking to re lower energy costs. And that was uh, led to some of the decisions about which resources are going to be included in these assets. Uh, in order to increase resilience, keep these facilities active, they could have just gone with adding more uh, diesel backup generators, uh, but you know, lower those don't save energy, any energy, uh, and they also don't have any environmental benefits as well. Um, another motivation behind this project is for the tribe to be able to have greater energy independence, and you know that kind of goes hand in hand with the the resilience. Uh, you know, the the tribe being so reliant, if the tribe is exclusively rely upon the grid, uh, you know they lack energy independence and are very uh, subject to the those impacts and, and have minimal resilience. Uh, Clean energy was also a driving factor behind this project and, and the selection of solar and energy storage assets uh, that can help the tribe increase the amount of renewable energy uh, uh, resources that they're using uh, uh, throughout the reservation. And uh, scalability. Uh, so, you know, the, the assets we're talking about, the systems we're talking about are, you know, they started off uh, even initially with some of the initial grant funding, and there's been more that have, uh, more funding that's come to these projects and from various sources, which I'll get into. Uh, but you know, creating the infrastructure that will allow the tribe to add more solar, to add more storage, to add more assets, uh, that and, and add more facilities uh, to these microgrids as desired as they move forward. Next slide, please. So the kind of three microgrids we're working on, uh, funded by the DOE, are uh, the fire station, and that's a, a single kind of solar plus storage plus backup diesel generator microgrid system, uh, 1,300, uh, almost 1,400 square feet built in 2006. And it's a residential fire station with a 911 emergency dispatch and also a serves as a primary emergency operations center. Uh, for the tribe and uh, you know provides you know essential fire protection and other services for the community the uh we're looking to install approximately 81 kilowatts of carport solar it originally was supposed to be rooftop solar but uh we uh more recently determined uh, or received the the feedback and direction from the tribe that the that facility cannot support uh solar on the rooftop it actually i think it's corrugated that facility may have more a corrugated metal roof um, they have an existing 420 kilowatt diesel generator um, which is extremely large for the their load but um you know it uh you know is it a, an asset that we're able to incorporate or seeking to incorporate into the microgrid and we'll be adding a uh, 50 kilowatt 132 kilowatt hour um so you know uh, uh two and a half hour battery to the facility that's you know sized to around the peak of the facility peak load of the facility uh, i'm going to jump down to the bottom one again you know the rincon government center uh, that facility was built in, in 2018 a uh, much larger facility almost 150,000 square feet houses a variety of essential government departments and services including the the tribal police station uh, but tribal leadership uh, legal uh, I mean, IT uh, are all uh, housed here, uh, and uh, you know this facility needs to remain online. It was initially uh, initially built with a 150 kilowatt generator that just just uh, keeps uh, emergency services for the facility online when the power goes out. Um, so we'll, we're seeking to add a 333 kilowatt 
uh, solar uh, carport PV system. Uh, originally, we were looking to use rooftop, but again, received feedback that um, that was not going to be an option for this facility. And uh, we'll also be adding a 174 kilowatts, approximately four hour battery, uh, lithium ion battery to that facility as well. Uh, just like the fire station, kind of a, a, a solar plus storage plus generator, single facility microgrid system. Uh, then we move on to the more complex resort area microgrid, which includes the Harris Resort in Southern California, wastewater treatment plant, travel plaza, and now more recently, one or more well pumps uh, uh, for the community. Uh, very large uh, a resort facility. Um, you can kind of see the details on these. The Travel Plaza includes a, a gas station and convenience store. Uh, we're finding two where that actually has a subway uh, as a tenant that we're looking, uh, looks like we'll have to be including or uh, we'll be including as well. Um, uh, so the, the tribally owned uh, complex, uh, the these are, are drinking water well pumps. And uh, the, the facility, in addition to being a uh, the the resort being a key economic driver of the community, serves as an emergency public shelter, a emergency operations center revolving around kind of the the commercial side for the for the tribe, uh, emergency response and evacuation staging areas. The, the wastewater treatment plant uh, certainly is a critical asset. Uh, it serves as a cooling center during high heat uh, events, and um, the the travel plaza provides food. Uh, other and other essentials, as well as uh, fuel for emergency vehicles and generators during emergency events and outages. Uh, so I mentioned the one megawatt of solar already there. We'll be adding uh, approximately five megawatts of, of um, round mounted solar PV. That second slide, uh, sorry, that third kind of note should actually uh, one megawatt of solar carport PV, not not uh, additional one megawatt of uh, oh, sorry, I, I, I'm misreading that wrong. That uh, so, yeah, one adding one additional megawatt of solar carports, five mega, approximately one five megawatts of ground um, ground mountain solar. Uh, looks like we're you know originally there was two two megawatts of diesel generators that we were hoping to incorporate in the microgrid. We are receiving feedback that from the EPC firm we're working with that the we're not going to be able to incorporate those two megawatts of generators. So sizing those the peak uh, to add additional redundancy, uh, looks like we'll be uh, adding up to four megawatts of diesel generators. Uh, and uh, you know where we're at right now in the engineering design, looks like uh, four and a half megawatt, one hour battery of lithium ion. In addition to that, um, there'll be uh, four 0.8 megawatt hours of flywheel energy storage systems and 4.8 megawatt hours of flow battery energy storage systems. And I'll, I'll get into the, you know, some of that, those details in a moment. Next slide, please. All right, so, you know, this is the visual, the existing solar is up to the northwest of the facility. Number one is where the wastewater treatment plant is located. Uh, number three, there's a facility called the Butler Building that houses the gaming commission as well as some, some storage and is already kind of tied in uh, to the electrical around the facility. And it uh, didn't, isn't as essential as other, uh, parts of the facility, uh, but um, you know it probably would cost more to exclude it than actually include it. Uh, so the one megawatt of solar would go just north of the parking structure, um, north of the resort. So the resort is number four in this map. And originally we were going to have uh, two megawatts of solar go over there. So the parking lot to the east, that one was also being covered with solar, but we received direction from the tribe that that was now unavailable. Uh, but uh, we were not originally considering the uh, a field over to the east uh, to be available, and now we were seeking to install up to approximately five uh, megawatts of solar over there. And originally, we were going to have the the solar and uh, sorry, the uh, flywheel and flow batteries be on the main campus, but we'll probably have those in the solar fields over to the east, and then down to the southeast. Uh, you know, we have the travel plaza. The lithium ion probably in the new diesel batteries would probably be on in the main campus uh, where the existing lithium ion and diesel generators are as well. And you know the, these will be all uh, these all these distributed energy resources and facilities will all be electrically interconnected and and uh, at a single uh, point of interconnection and all controllable, uh, so that the 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 energy assets and and the resources capacity and and generation can be distributed. Uh, throughout these facilities as as desired. 
to optimize for both uh, maximizing or, or achieving the desired resilience and uh, also um, maximizing cost savings uh, as well. Um, so just you know a little bit more on that. Let's see, do I talk about it here? I'm running through my slides. Um, so, you know, we originally received a uh, a two million dollar grant for this project, this and the fire station, and it was more for the kind of infrastructure backbone uh, that would enable the tribe to invest in in uh, additional assets to add into this microgrid, including more solar and energy storage. Uh, shortly after receiving that award, uh, a California Energy Commission opportunity for non-lithium ion long duration storage presented itself. And so the, we worked with the tribe to pursue that opportunity and secured $7.2 million for the flow and flywheel energy storage systems projects. Uh, and around that time too, California released their um, self-generation incentive program, equity resilience uh, rebate for energy storage systems for critical facilities located uh, within a high fire threat districts that are being subject to public safety power shutoff events. So we've uh, pursued and secured uh, rebates, I think approximately $4 million worth of rebates for these facilities to support energy storage. Um, and, uh, and we pursued the cost as a result of COVID, pursued the cost share reduction for this facility as well. Which has all been needed, particularly as a result of COVID. We found that costs across the board are, have significantly increased for, um, for these assets, and so uh, you know it's it's actually the the cost the cost share uh, reduction uh, and 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 actually the I guess the tax equity investment I'll get to more in a moment have allowed this project to continue to stay afloat. Uh, whereas otherwise, you know, the 25% uh, or so increase in costs we've seen as a result of uh, rising prices of steel and supply chain and tra uh, transportation related costs, uh, you know, could have possibly sunk the project. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so this is just kind of a, a little bit clearer uh, picture of where some of the the store, solar and storage assets will be located. You, you know, you could see the the main campus before. Uh, we considered the rooftops of the casino as well as the, the top of the parking structure, and identified that that wasn't a viable option. There just wasn't uh, there was enough information available uh, about those facilities whether they could support the solar or, or not, and uh, and also the age of the roofs as well. And with the parking uh, the parking structure that that one of the hotel towers actually shades half the parking structures, um, so it just wasn't really a good fit. We did consider kind of, you know, having kind of a cantilever type solar array potentially going along the western side of the property, uh, but shading is an issue. And you can see some of that there, and it just, you know, didn't seem really worthwhile to to pursue to pursue that. Uh, but ultimately, the tribe did choose to to uh, um, the latest direction was to uh, install in areas number one and two, uh, and then and then we're looking to probably. As I mentioned, locate the solar, the flywheel, and uh, flow batteries over in area number two as well. Next slide, please. Uh, so I described this earlier, just kind of simple for the fire station, uh, simple solar plus storage plus diesel generator, relatively simple uh, project compared to the one you just saw. Um, uh, and you know, this is we're still kind of in preliminary stages of design and engineering, but we've uh, already identified the uh, you know more appropriate place for the solar, a uh, feasible place for the solar, uh, which is not going to be on the rooftop, which was originally what it was designed uh, or proposed. And uh, I'm making good headway on this project. Um, uh, next, uh, so I guess one consideration here was this is a fire station and you know there are fire trucks that are coming in and out and, and other uh, vehicles that have a higher clearance and so that was a consideration and making sure that we talk to the fire chief uh, about what are going to be the required clearances uh, and, and uh, that will accommodate the vehicles as well. Next slide please. Uh, so this is the uh, latest uh, design for the Rincon Government Center microgrid project and um, uh, so we have the solar carport, which is in the teal, about 333 kilowatt 
uh, again, you know, originally we we're going to place on the rooftop, or we were uh, 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 based on our diligence and, and the direction we received, uh, move that to to solar carports uh, as versus a combination of solar carports and rooftop. Uh, the existing generator is up uh, the north part of this picture, uh, surrounded in the the blue boxes, and we're we're looking to add the lithium ion um, facilities uh, in that in that proximity as well. But again, you know, kind of single meter relatively simple system compared to the resort area one. Next slide, please. Uh, so these projects, uh, you know, the part, you know, really these are complex projects that require a lot of, uh, a lot of partnerships and uh, uh, teaming up to and collaboration to ensure their success. And this is, you know, the, pro the partners in all the projects you know the tribe itself being the the prime the the main recipient and, and benef, uh, beneficiary of all these projects and serving their facilities in their community. Um, the EPC engineering procurement and construction firms and technology providers we're working with include uh, PowerFlex, uh, formerly EDF Renewables, um, and they're under uh, under EDF uh, for the government center. Sorry, the uh, resort area. Microgrid project and PowerFlex is you know, a worldwide company that's done um, many large scale energy projects, including several microgrid projects. And Infinity is the provider of the flow battery system that we're working with uh, for that project. Amber Kinetics is the provider of the uh, flywheel energy storage system module. So both Infinity and Amber Kinetics are just providing the, the hardware for those systems, the modules that will be installed by PowerFlex. Uh, and then for the fire station and government center projects, uh, Swell Energy is um, uh, expected to be the, uh, the, the EPC or design build contractor for uh, those two systems. Uh, so I, I mentioned, you know, Prosper Sustainably is uh, um, the, the kind of prime uh, project manager, owner's representative for these projects. We're supported by Microgrid Institute and Our, Our Energy. Um, uh, we are also working with Godfrey Khan on uh, some various negotiations of EPC contracts, but also in negotiations with um, our financing partners. So we are pursuing a, a tax equity deal covering all three of these projects in partnership with Solaris Energy and Nikola Power uh, to capture the uh, investment tax credit and depreciation values uh, for this project, and also to reduce the out-of-pocket costs for the tribe as well. So, um, you know, it's an opportunity. There's there's still, I think, 20% investment tax credit available to tax liable entities, as well as a depreciation value. And so these, uh, by partnering with this type of entity, uh, with a tax equity partner, allows us to bring greater revenues to the project and, and kind of lower some of the out-of-pocket costs and, and kind of repay it over time through a, a pre-negotiated PPA rate that will be um, will need to be lower than what the tribe is paying for energy right now as well. And that's what, you know, Godfrey Khan is supporting us in negotiating those deal, those deal documents. But it's been great. We have lots of great team members. I also do want to mention that we are receiving, uh, applied for receiving technical assistance from the Office of Indian Energy. Uh, Tony Jimenez from NREL has been supporting this project as well, and looking at some of the more nuanced uh, parts of this project and, and supporting where, where he's, he and NREL are able to. Uh, as you you know see from the the resort area microgrid project, it's extremely complex. It's very cutting edge. It's going to be the first microgrid of its kind in the world. It's um, the the kind of we are uh, I think on the on the cutting edge of of the storage technologies and the combination and the sizing of those storage technologies that are being used in terms of microgrids, but also the sophistication of controls that are going to need to be utilized for this project are extremely complex and. Um, you know, we are appreciative of their support and being able to better understand and evaluate uh, what are really kind of newer approaches and technologies that have not been actually considered and employed perhaps in the world. So, um, you know, very, very appreciative of, of, of his support and, and DOE support uh, on that aspect of the project. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just kind of gives a better idea of, of you know, there's going to ultimately be a Rincon uh, 
it says Solaris, you know, Solaris is really uh, helping identify uh, and um, a tax equity investor. So there'll be a, a Rincon tax equity investor LLC uh, that will ultimately uh, enter into the EPC agreements, or if the Rin Rincon enters into those, the Rincon will contribute those EPC agreements into uh, the LLC. And there'll be an operating an LLC operating agreement as well as a solar services agreement slash power purchase agreement uh, that sets the price of energy for the tribe. But ultimately, this this you know the tribe is going to be a member of this LLC, and this project is being uh, th this whole project and this structure is is to maximize the benefits for the tribe uh, and, and its community. Next slide, please. Um, so this is, these are kind of the key project activities, major project activities. Uh, so, you know, we've gotten through selecting design build contractors and, and financing groups, or at least financing representatives. Um, we are in ongoing negotiations and the process, uh, 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 ongoing negotiations and process of finalizing the EPC and financing agreements for the uh the Harrow's microgrid project, because due to the complexity of the project, um, the EPC was just unable to kind of their their preferred methodology and would you know could have been preferred on our side as well or for the tribe would have been to you know have just a kind of full scope EPC engineering procurement construction contract that included you know the the, the engineering uh, from 30 through 100 percent and then construction, but just due to complexity of this project, it just there needed to be a, a, a uh, an initial engineering contract to actually come up with uh, the cost of the project and the final design as well. And so we're in the stages. Uh, we we have a development engineering services agreement with. Um, PowerFlex, then there we're almost at 30% design right now. We have some initial cost estimates and, and expect to, uh, to arrive at firm fixed pricing at 60%, which would then allow us to sign the kind of the construction, the final the engineering construction agreements. But also we want to negotiate, pre-negotiate and pre-agree to the terms and conditions for operations and maintenance uh, for this project as well, ideally with PowerFlex uh, too. And and um, you know on the other for the other two projects we're just you know just entering into design build it's more like design build contracts with swell for the full scope of those projects uh, and and the, the O and M is not as critical to negotiate and finalize up front but we we may we're kind of working through some term sheets on those as well to see whether or not we want to or need to uh, pre negotiate those. Um, so, you know, we are in progress in that design engineering uh, and permitting really for all three projects. Uh, uh, they're at kind of different stages, um, you know, kind of our swell is doing some initial design engineering in order to get far enough, enough along to come up with a firm fixed price for their EPC agreement. Uh, and uh, but we're, you know, we're happy with the progress we've making or making on that. Uh, once we complete the, the development engineering for the resort area, and, and complete the, the design build contracts for the fire station and uh, government center microgrids. Uh, we then move into construction. Uh, and um, we may, for the resort area, do that in phases. Uh, so, you know, the, the tribe is continuously subject to these PSPS outages. Uh, one kind of wild card, which I think John's going to probably share with you, uh, and all this in terms of timing is working with the utilities. Uh, and we're both working with SDG&E on this and their process for reviewing and approving various things such as interconnection or, or uh, equipment upgrades or anything like that. It can can be frustratingly long and hard to gauge ahead of time. So, uh, you know, we're going to probably seek to install the back, you know, install the backup generators if possible in advance to be able to create, provide some resilience for some of the facility, uh, install the, the microgrid infrastructure that can hopefully be kind of deployed, uh, install commission deployed it, to the extent, you know, it, possible perhaps in advance of when we get the approval for the solar and storage interconnection from SDG&E. Uh, so, you know, the process, uh, you know, of going through an interconnection application, completing any studies that they're requiring, um, it, it just, it delay, you know, it, it can add significant delays 
uh, to those projects. There are some proceedings going on in California that are seeking to accelerate those, and we're seeking to leverage those and in, in keeping SCG on the ball uh, for microgrid projects. Uh, but you know, it's it's still there's not like any firm definitive time frame with which we can expect them to complete that, and we're going to be up and ready to run on those projects. But ultimately, you know, we may be installing those in phases. If it works out, maybe we'll install them and deploy them all at once. Uh, and and then you know once they're they're fully commissioned and deployed, we'll then be moving into ongoing operations and maintenance, performance monitoring, and reporting. Next slide, please. Uh, so lessons learned. First and foremost, uh, don't try to uh, install a complex microgrid project in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> but I don't think anybody could anticipate that. Uh, so just you know that kind of is what it is. Unfortunately, things are still working out. Um, you know, I think, you know, for this project I talked about where we, the tribe really was, you know, they were experiencing these outages and, you know, the economics for them are not just, not just the, the, the cost savings on ongoing energy, uh, uh, usage, but also the, the cost to their community when these facilities shut down and have been shutting down as a result, result of these PSPS outages. So, you know, they committed even just to that $2 million to install the microgrid back, backbone to put in this infrastructure that will enable them uh, to pursue resilience. And that initial commitment and those in, in the, of, of those resources led to a lot more resources that I talked about, that CEC grant, uh, the SGIP rebate, a second DOE grant for the government center, uh, and then ultimately the tax equity uh, financing itself. Uh, so along those lines, the tax equity financing, there, you know, there is the opportunity to generate significant, uh, to bring in uh, additional revenues uh, through the investment tax credit and depreciation, and, and to uh, reduce the kind of uh, initial investment cost to the tribe uh, that you know can make it easier for them to invest over time, which you know hopefully. You know, it's done in a way where the tribe is still benefiting. You know, the economic benefit is greater than if they just invested on their own. Uh, but there's challenges that come along with with that type of relationship and that partnership. There's a, a lot of legal negotiations, there's a lot of complexity of these deals. It's extra complex due to the, the the complex nature of these projects. These tax equity groups are used to doing solar and maybe solar plus storage projects, but then when you talk about solar plus uh, three forms of storage, two forms of storage that really are not common, flywheel and flow batteries. Um, and, and there being a significant amount of, of infrastructure upgrades that need to take place in order to actually interconnect at the Rincon, uh, the, the, Her the resort area, I forgot to mention there, I think there's eight or nine, maybe 10 meters now, you know, still a little bit of a moving target that we're seeking to consolidate. And there, there still is a lot of uh, uncertainty regarding the, the final costs that are going to be associated with those infrastructure upgrades. Um, so, you know, th there's a there's just some balance. There's some transact there's transaction costs that are going to occur. So ultimately, those transaction costs need to be balanced against what what it actually will be the the benefits to the tribe, both financially and otherwise, to pursuing this type of, of arrangement and relationship. Uh, but we're we're still you know on track to make this work, and hopefully creating a template for other for future projects uh, as well. Um, Existing building electrical plans and information may be limited, and I, I, I don't think I've ever, uh, I don't, I'm not sure. You know, I'm working on several microgrid, tribal microgrid projects right now, and I, there has not been a single one where we've had complete information on either the building, the electrical, the campus, uh, the, there's been gaps in information. And that just leads to more costs in terms of doing diligence. Uh, for, you know, so it'll you know increases the costs, uh, but you know certainly gather what you can ahead of time, and then you know it may lead to underground rate. Uh, um, just kind of oh, I can't remember the terminology, but John, you guys used it for your project. Um, uh, where they have to do underground radar to just detect utilities to make sure that when they're digging and trenching, they're not hitting anything. Um, ground penetrating radar, I want to say. Anyways, uh, so rooftop solar I mentioned before may not be feasible, and we found that uh, with 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 the uh, all of the Rincon projects, partially due to just the lack of of information there is available uh, on those. But some of it can just the actual roof type itself, the age of the roof. Um, uh, so you know, just kind of consider that from the beginning as well. 
it's good to, to you want to define the owner's project requirements before design engineering and you know in terms of like what it, what's in and what's out for these projects and and you know i think john will talk about that a little bit on his project too in, in terms of what facilities we were seeking to include versus not and can, you know it's not you seek to define define those to the best of your ability but i think keep an open mind for what could maybe be included as well uh, but also existing energy assets may not be compatible with the microgrid so we found with the existing two megawatts of of diesel generators that uh, were already on site at Harrah's, um, they're not compatible with the system. They they just installed a new generator, 150, I think 150 kW generator over the travel plaza. That's not going to be compatible. They can remain as like an extra level of redundancy that can be deployed once if the microgrid system goes down, but they're not going to be able to run within the microgrid itself. Uh, so um, it's just you know it and it, it may be that they're they they could they could be included but the cost of including those the cost of the controls or upgrading those 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 uh the those distributed energy resources with the ability to communicate with microgrid controls is just just cost prohibitive um so just because you have a diesel generator there or just even because you know the stem battery we thought we could include that doesn't look like that's going to be an option to include you know there's still going to be value in some of those assets being on site uh, but, um, you know, it's the, the original assumption that we could include those was incorrect. Uh, I, you know, it's good to be ultra conservative with budget and time estimates. Uh, you know, we our in electrical infrastructure is, is costs are going to be higher than anticipated. Uh, you know, there's a lot of we're seeking to acquire SDG and &E infrastructure transformers. Uh, it seems to be it'll be less costly if we can leave use what's there and leave it in there. But that requires us to go through a process to work with SDG &E to acquire that equipment. We don't know exactly what those costs will be, but it presumably is going to be significantly less expensive than than actually replacing those. Uh, we found that it's possible that the tribe has already paid for some of that electrical infrastructure that SCG and &E installed when the when they did actually build the casino. So then, you know, making sure that you're aware of that if you are seeking to acquire the electrical infrastructure of the utility, that you're not actually paying them twice because they may not know or they may not volunteer that you've already paid for it, uh, and 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 there it may not just be kind of common knowledge. Um, you know, there's transaction costs. I mean, there just there's also there'll be un there'll be costs that'll be missed. I mean, I think I've keep coming to these conversations and we come up with our 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 kind of capex uh, capital uh, expenditures or investment costs budget line items, and I, I keep coming back to all. And sometimes like something will come up that wasn't previously considered. And you know, it may not be within the scope of the EPC, but you know, we need to ensure that we are capturing and considering all costs of the all potential costs of the project not missing anything uh because if we miss anything you know ultimately that's going to lead to issues with the ppa rate and and the investment for the tribe so you know seeking to ensure that you capture every potential possible cost and are as conservative as conservative as possible it's better to start with something you know as expensive as it can be and be able to go down in cost rather than uh, you know, find yourself with the costs increasing. And then, you know, in this case, the pandemic did not help with any of this as well. And then transaction costs too, you know, considering those uh, depending on to what extent they're applicable. But if even if you're not considering a tax equity deal, if you're you're considering a complex microgrid project, negotiations themselves may be more costly if you need some legal support on that. Uh, microgrid projects can be extra complex. I mean, I think it's, it's still... I would say uh, it's a new it's a new new approach. Microgrids, to a certain degree, have been in existence for a while, but the type of microgrids we're seeing right now are really kind of a, a recent uh, phenomenon. And um, you know, there are simpler projects such as the the uh, fire station and uh, government center projects um, that I don't know would be cost effective if there wasn't grant funding necessarily to support them, uh, but you know, those are those are easier to design, engineer, and construct uh, relatively. Maybe not as easy as just like a, a standalone solar, uh, but then getting the resort area that's that's a whole different beast. Uh, but there are, there are abundance of technology providers, considerations, and approaches that should you know can and should be considered within within reason. Um, so you know, just just because you have one EPC telling you that this is the way that it you know can should be done i don't think you should necessarily take that at face value so it's also important to ensure that you have representation and you have experts on your side sorry experts on your side that 
uh, are able to help you evaluate and, and press again, you know, uh, to evaluate options to um, and, and to ensure that you know you have somebody. And you know, I don't I don't know that there's any you know it was simpler projects. It's easier to kind of run the gamut, and with complex projects, it's just you know, there's nobody out there that's like kind of a one-stop shop that knows everything about microgrid projects because it's continuing to evolve. Uh, and I already talked about the necessity of engineering before the EPC contract is, as well. And that was in that case, the resort area microgrid just because of the complexity of that project. And just, we couldn't get to the, like, we did, there was, we just didn't have enough information. Like we just, there needed to be further diligence and the EPC is only willing to go so far on their own dime uh to to do that and you know you should seek to have them do that for simpler projects but for more complex projects it's not really it's not really reasonable and if they're they're going to be asked to if they're going to be asked to give you a firm fixed price and do all that diligence then they're uh with on their own dime and they're going to give you extremely conservative pro costs that means you'll likely be paying way more than you probably should be for, for uh, a project next slide And uh, that's it. So I uh, hope that this was helpful. Um, I think these slides will become available. I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody wants to reach out to me to learn more. And there'll be a Q&A at the end uh, as well. And I you know, look forward to presenting next year as well uh, on our progress and new lessons learned and, and ultimately how we are at that point, hopefully in, you know, in, in advanced construction and hopefully you know, nearing commissioning and making this project a complete success all around. Uh, but then, you know, again, thank you to the, to the DOE. Uh, thank you all for participating uh, today and uh, I wish you all success with your projects. Great. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate you taking the time to share the Rincon microgrid projects with us. Um, just a quick reminder, if anybody has any questions, uh, you can submit them at any time by clicking on the question button located in the webinar control box on your screen and just typing your question. And again, we'll address those during the Q&A at the end of the presentations. Okay, next up is John Flores with the San Pasqual Band of Mission Indians. Uh, take it away, John, when you're ready. Hi, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's good to be with you, even if it is in a virtual format, and hopefully next year we can all be together um, presenting and talking about these wonderful projects. Great presentation, Josh, by the way. Lots of good work down there at RingCon. Um, I'm going to be talking about our San uh microgrid project that we are working on and nearing completion. So, and I had the pleasure of working with Joshua Simmons and his team on this one as well. Um, and it's been a long time in the making with a lot of things we did not foresee happening when we started this project, like a pandemic, obviously. And, um, but we worked through a lot of those issues and we're almost at the end uh, of the finish line. So next slide, please. All right, some just general information about the Semiscal Band. Um, our reservation is 3,100 acres. Uh, 280 tribal members, that's enrolled tribal members with 1,400 lineal descendants. The reservation population is about 1,600 people with 450 homes, um, of which of those 450 homes, 83 have solar. We did get a previous DOE uh, solar grant uh, to do community solar on our reservation. Um, so that's how we got a lot of those uh, solar homes and we work with Grid Alternatives to do solar on this reservation. And now we're starting to diversify our portfolio and get into larger scale renewable energy projects. Um, we're still an eye to individual residential homes as well, and that will be the next project I'll be talking about. Uh, also, we're located in San Diego County. We're less than a mile from Rincon, um, so we're really close to the Rincon Reservation. Actually, San Diego County has 18 federally recognized uh, tribal governments here, which is the most of uh, any county in the entire U.S. Um, so we're close to several reservations, and we all talk and collaborate and work together on, on all sorts of projects. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, forward. All right, thank you. Always going forward, never moving backwards um, is our motto here. <laughs> So the reservation, there's a map of our reservation. Um, all the stuff in orange is trust land. Everything hashed out is fee land. So almost 2,000 acres of trust land, 1,100 acres of fee land. 
And you see we're a little checkerboarded, so we're not one contiguous uh, reservation. Um, that adds some complexity, obviously, to our projects that we're trying to do when trying to do large projects on different portions of the reservation and connecting the dots. But we make it work. Uh, San Francisco has a casino and resort, which is the Valley View Casino and Resort, which the tribe owns and operates. We operate the Woods Valley Golf Club as well. Um, and we have a new gas station convenience store um, as well on the reservation that we just opened. So uh, the reservation is growing in, in, in acreage, it's growing in population, it's growing its economic portfolio, and we are growing our energy portfolio as well uh, to meet the needs of the San Francisco Reservation in the 21st century. Next slide, please. So one reason why we decided to get into microgrids, and Josh kind of touched on this a little bit, a lot of the same challenges that Raincon faces, San Pasqual faces as well. Um, we are in a high fire, well, it seems like all of California and the Southwest is a high fire danger area now, and fire season is about year round. We have experienced several fires near the reservation, and one very large fire that burned about 90 per 95% of the reservation where we lost about, I want to say about 60 residential homes from that fire. So that fire would have been the 2003 Paradise Cedar fire, um, heavily impacted the reservation, uh, evacuated the reservation. All these fires actually that you see on this map uh, caused power outages to the entire reservation, um, evacuations from the reservation, and unfortunately, um, loss of structures, but fortunately, no loss of life. So, you know, things can always be rebuilt, homes can be re rebuilt, um, but you cannot rebuild a life uh, that is lost in a fire. So our emergency personnel, the fire, the Temple does have a fire department and police department that works closely with the surrounding emergency personnel, did a wonderful job of getting everyone safely off the re reservation and then safely returned to the reservation during these fires. Next slide, please. So some of the threats and impacts to us um, with energy, um, you know, severe weather, high winds, we get the Santa Ana winds that blow through here, usually in October and November, wildfires, Southern California, um, we get earthquakes. We get lots of earthquakes actually. So if you're thinking of moving here, uh, be careful, lots of earthquakes, very scary. I'm just joking. Uh, we don't get that many earthquakes, but when they do occur, they can be damaging. Uh, you know, localized physical damage to the, the grid, you know, um, distracted driving, someone's, you know, on their cell phone, they hit a pole, grid goes down. Uh, SDG and system upgrades, that is the most common outage we've experienced the last four or so years. These are planned outages, so they're not, they're a little easier to deal with than unplanned outages that you get with severe weather and um, the like. But they are planned outages that do disrupt our, you know, our day-to-day -day operations here. SDG&E has been doing a lot of system upgrades, which includes uh, wood to steel pole conversion. So they're taking out wood, wood poles and putting in steel poles. They've recently been doing a ton of undergrounding of poles now, so now they're even getting rid of some of those steel poles and putting their circuits underground. So lots of plant outages that have been occurring the last three years. Um, so the impact, unfortunately, when power goes out, um, we aren't able to use our facilities, lost productivity and revenues. Uh, San Pasquale's government center is unique in the sense that we have no backup uh, generators whatsoever. We have no diesel generators. We we have it wired so that we can accept a backup diesel generator if needed, but the tribe does not own one. So when an outage happens, we have to go rent one from a heavy equipment supplier like a Hawthorne or a CAT, um, which isn't bad when we have a planned outage because we can go ahead of time and rent this and hook it up. Unfortunately, it's the unplanned outages where we don't have that generator on standby, where power goes out and we have to send basically everybody home until we can get a backup generator. Uh, so that was one of the reasons why we wanted to do a microgrid project. I was able to work with tribal leadership and we were looking at buying a diesel generator. However, you know, through lots of meetings and 
lots of um, community engagement, uh, outreach and education to leadership and the community, we were able to explain the benefits of a microgrid and why that was a better route to take than a diesel generator. You know, my saying during that whole time was, a microgrid is a 21st century solution to a 21st century problem. Why would we use old 20th century technology, a diesel generator, to solve a problem that's unique to this century? So uh, after a lot of, I said, outreach and education, they said, let's go for it because they saw a greater benefit to the tribe with the microgrid rather than the diesel generator. Next slide, please. So these are some of the talking points and education and outreach that I did with the uh, leadership here on why a microgrid is better than a diesel generator. Resiliency, obviously that was the number one thing, maintain electrical power during an outage. So that was our number one priority here with the government center because we are a government and if the government can't you know, function during a power outage, then we cannot provide services to our people. Uh, secondly, which of course the business committee likes, every government runs on a budget um, and every government has to set aside a large chunk of money each year to pay your utility, to keep the lights running, to keep the AC blowing. So with the a microgrid, with the solar plus battery, we were able to reduce our electrical costs significantly. This is where we're going to see, a, we're, we're estimating a potentially huge savings in our electric bill each year. Um, so that money that we otherwise be paying to scg &E can now go back into the tribal government for other services to either enhance the services we currently offer or provide new services to our um, tribal community here. So that money, you know, instead of going off the reservation into scg and es pockets, we're going to be able to keep that money on the reservation and keep that money circulating within the reservation economy. Uh, and then, you know, lastly, well, not lastly in my eyes, course, but um, is environmental. Um, you know, 100% renewable, we're going to reduce our emissions, no diesel generators, which is great, so that will help reduce emissions because we won't be firing up diesel generators. We'll be, you know, pulling less energy from the grid, so that means, you know, less uh, emissions from sdg e to get power to us. Um, you know, and so these are the three, you know, the three legs of the microgrid stool, so to speak, uh, you know, why to what held up the microgrid stool. And, you know, for each entity or each group that I spoke with, you know, different ones were more important than others, but they were all important, maybe not equally for every group, but they all definitely checked the box. So this really helped get the buy-in from leadership down to the community to even the department because, um, you know, we have different departments here that have different needs um, within the government. And I had to actually, you know, get them on board as well. So when you're doing this, don't just think of leadership and the community, but also this is going to impact potential other, your other departments that you share a building with. Um, and so you want to, you know, help them see the benefits to their department as well. Uh, next slide, please. So these are our, what we identified as our priority critical electric loads, and this makes up our government center complex, are these buildings you see here. We have a main tribal administration building, we, and within that building is also our tribal hall, so uh, that's really two buildings kind of in one. Um, that's how some, it's a Red Cross evacuation center. Our tribal admin building also has our large tribal hall with a full kitchen, um, and so that our tribal uh, fire department and police department worked with Red Cross to make that a certified Red Cross evacuation sh uh, center and shelter. Uh, it's also our tribal command and control center in case of an emergency. Um, finance is there. So in case that there's a big um, emergency and we need to cut checks for whatever reason, uh, obviously you need your finance department up and running to move that money to get it from you know, where it's at to where it needs to be in the hands of helping people, whether it's getting a hotel room if they're evacuated or fire and police if they need equipment um, or buying food to hand out to our community members. So it's important that we keep that tribal admin building up, um, both to keep the money flowing in case of emergency and also the evacuation center for fire and police to bring people in. Housing and security um, has their own, and that, you know, that's obviously critical. Um, fire department, that's a no-brainer. You saw how, um, how many fires we've had in our 
history and there's even, you know, it just need to keep your fire up and running. Our education building is also an emergency public shelter with its own kitchen, its own bathroom that we can house people in. Our preschool is also an emergency public shelter. And then we have a small wastewater treatment plant for our government center and complex, um, you know, that obviously you would want to keep running in case of emergency. And you can see the various critical loads. You know, the majority of it's going to be, you know, HVAC, um, lighting, uh, and then food storage with the kitchen. So this is what makes up our government center, the core government center of the San Francisco, uh, San Francisco government. And this is what was important to keep up and running 24-7, 365 with power. Next slide. So here is our proposed microgrid components. Uh, solar PV, we were building 157 uh, KW of new PV. We had an existing 24 KW on our education building that we were able to complete in a previous DOE grant that we received. So the, the we were able to tie that existing um, solar from the previous DOE grant to the new uh, pro, uh, new system. We did decide to put in, instead of a diesel generator, a propane genset. Um, that's just a little bit of redundancy. It's technically the third back or the second backup to our microgrid or to our power needs because the way we view this system is uh, you know, the grid is the first line of defense, right? That's our first, um, uh, our first supplier of power to the reservation is SDG&E. If SDG&E goes off, then the microgrid is the backup. And then if for some reason the microgrid with the PV and, and battery cannot keep up with the energy demand, say power is out for several days, during the winter when the days are shorter and it might be cloudy or you might have ash covered skies so you're not getting the full recharge, then the propane genset will kick on to fire up and charge the battery and keep the microgrid going. So the propane genset is really a backup to the backup. Um, we don't really anticipate using it um, at all. And if we do, then we're in a major catastrophe type emergency going on here. Um, but you know, all of our modeling shows that that propane gen set should not, you know, be used um, during most uh, public shutoff events. Uh, the battery storage, energy storage system, <clears throat> 120 kW is what we plan. Um, you'll see in the later slide, uh, we were able to, with efficiencies and purchasing, get something a little bit bigger and size something a little bit larger, which was great. Um, and that's another reason why we don't plan on using propane gen set because we were able to actually build a little bit larger. Uh, storage unit there, the microgrid controls, and then energy management controls um, that would control all of the HVAC and everything on the system uh, is part of it as well. My, next slide, please. So here is our tribal government center complex, and you can see uh, the different buildings that we are connecting in and the different points of where we're putting things. So. Up in the upper left-hand corner is our carport PV. That's the new PV that we're putting in. Uh, number one is our admin and tribal hall building. And then number, or, sorry, one is admin, two is tribal hall, three is police and housing, four is fire, six and five are education, eight is the um, wastewater treatment plant, and seven is the preschool. And then we had some, uh, uh, the solar, previous solar we had installed, you can see is on the education building on the roof there between five and six uh, was the existing solar. And you can see we're putting our battery storage and propane gen set <coughs> over by the police station. And we were bringing three phase power up from SDG&E into the complex to provide power um, to the whole government center. And we also have an existing propane tank at number two, that we um, might tie into the backup propane gin set. The backup propane gin set is going to have its own standalone 500 gallon tank, and then the other tank is also 500 gallon. So we might we might tie that in in case you know we need extra propane, but we don't we don't think we will. So we we probably will not do that after all. And you can see where we're going to run our cables. Um, you know, Josh Simmons kind of mentioned on this. Uh, on his last presentation, 
when this first when this project first got started, every all the solar was going to go on the roof, right? You know, we we're going to put all the solar on the roof. That was the initial plan. Unfortunately, once we dived into it a little bit more, the tribe decided not to go that route. So just like Josh's one, it kind of got moved to the carports, which was fine. Luckily, we had the space to put it on there. Um, so, you know, that's just an example of how things change. You know, I think everyone's intentions when they do a PV or PV and battery project is always put solar on the roof because that's typically what you do and is a standard. But um, in this project, it was decided they didn't want to do that for several reasons. So it got moved to the uh, the carports, 100% on the carports now. Next slide, please. So project benefits, offset. So you see we're going to do 108% of grid electricity offset. So we're going to basically offset our entire sdg e electrical costs. Um, and then I spoke a little bit about provide redundant ba backup power with the, the battery and also the uh, the uh, propane genset. Um, one thing that's not on the slide, on this slide that you'll see, um, but you'll see going forward, is we also put in six EV charging stations as well. Uh, we're trying to electrify our government fleet and we're trying to, um, you know, incentivize, uh, you know, employees and giving them a charging put an area to charge their cars if they have EVs or hybrids and also, um, you know, community members to uh, charge any EVs they might have. So we know the future is EVs. So we decided to put some EV charging stations in on this project as well. Next slide, please. This is a project team. So from San Francisco Band of Mission Indians, you have myself, the environmental director. Dave Martinez, our public works director, who's been instrumental in all the on the ground, you know, work of laying conduit and breaking up the asphalt because he goes back in behind and repairs it all. Um, Desiree Morales, our utilities manager, who's been working with SDG&E for interconnection issues, um, getting utility uh, data and information uh, to our, our, you know, our partners so that we can do get everything sized correctly. Owners rep, Joshua Simmons uh, from Prosper Sustainability, Michael Burr, Microgrid Institute, and then Dustin Jolly from Our Energy. And then our design build contractors and Ralph uh, Siralati from Green Realities, Vipul Gore from Gridscape Solutions. And then for code compliance, um, we work with Eskio, which is a private code compliance company who also, um, he's not on the side, but our planning director, Andrew Orozco, um, worked very closely with Eskio on all code compliance to make sure that everything's getting a third party inspection of what our design build team is doing um, and that they're meeting all you know electrical codes for the safety of the San Francisco Band of Indians and our building. Next slide, please. So project status and accomplishments to date. So contracted design build contractor, that's been contracted out for a while now. Um, we complete the application for three-phase service and interconnection. We completed all the design engineering. Our construction activities are 95% complete. It's probably actually closer to 98% complete because um, all we really have left to do is install the backup generator, the uh, propane genset. Everything else has been installed in this program, and SDG &E has finished pretty much all of their installation for their equipment as well. And our plan is right now, and this is conservative, we hope to be on, on sooner, but our plan is to have the government center completely tied into the microgrid by the end of December. We actually have one building that's been connected to the microgrid and been online for about the last four months. That's our education building. And we've had no issues. We've been you know, running system tests and diagnostics with just them on. It's a small load, so it's not really stressing the microgrid too much. Um, actually, our issue is, you know, that with the solar on and the microgrid on, we're almost producing so much energy now that um, sometimes we have to turn off the PV so that we don't overproduce because we just can't, we're just not using all of the energy yet. So, but the plan is to have all the government building, on, all government center buildings tied in December 31st. Next slide, please. We still need to purchase and install our backup propane generator. Now, this has been the biggest headache, and it's largely due to, to uh, COVID supply chain issues that we're having. Um, you know, Josh touched on this a little bit. Of course, when we started this project, 
COVID wasn't, a, wasn't around, you know, no one had heard of COVID, everything was running fairly smoothly. And then of course COVID hit. Luckily we had purchased the majority of our equipment, our PV, our batteries and, and, and conduit and wire had been purchased um, either prior to COVID really getting, uh, really starting or just as COVID was starting. So we were kind of fortunate in that the majority of our materials and everything were procured and purchased before the real issues of COVID um, hit our society and the issues of um, you know, supply chains and material cost increases. Um, but the one that we couldn't avoid, unfortunately, was the backup propane gen set. It was kind of held off um, early. We held off on buying it just because uh, we didn't need it. You know, it was the last piece of the puzzle. And so we were going to put it in last. And now, you know, I wish we would have bought it earlier because uh, the generators themselves, the cost of them has gone up and the lead time to get one. Um, has also been difficult. It's also been a little difficult because our generator has to have certain controls in it that can talk to the microgrid. So while we found generators, you know, not all generators are equal in terms of what they offer and control. And so some of the generators we, we found, um, they just will not work with our microgrid, which is we want a generator that, um, you know, we want to keep it very simple where our generator will once the battery is depleted to a certain percentage, say 20%, the generator will turn itself on and start charging the battery. The generators we've been finding, we would have to manually go out there, turn on the generator to charge the battery, and then we would have to manually go turn it off, right? Um, you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's not too big of a deal. We do that already with our, um, you know, with our generators, whether they're diesel or not. And that's true, but our our um, microgrid setup and what we put out to bid calls for the generator to be, you know, self-starting and, and self, you know, uh, turn off and, and uh, talking with our battery. So that's what we designed for and that's what we, you know, put in the contract for. So that's what we plan on getting. We also believe that it just keep, keeps everything easier for our public works department. So they don't have to go out there and turn on a generator. We don't have to like be monitoring the battery and say, oh, we're at 20% because, you know, the minute someone has to monitor something is the minute they're out sick and then the battery is a piece of zero and now the power goes out and we don't want that. Uh, once everyone's on, on the microgrid, we plan on running a test on fully operation microgrid. We're still waiting for to uh, get our PTO from scg &E. All the paperwork's been turned in. Uh, this has taken a lot longer than I anticipated um, for various reasons. So, you know, PTO can be very difficult, you know, the utilities, uh, SCG&E has been somewhat very, somewhat difficult to work with uh, on the project, um, you know, for whatever reason, maybe it's because there are a lot of them, other people are working from home. So maybe there's just not that much uh, communication isn't a streamlined with SCG&E since the majority of their people are working from home. I don't know what it is, but we're hoping to get uh, PTO here soon from SCG&E. And then we plan on doing a ribbon cutting ceremony probably early 2022. So if anyone wants to come out to San Diego and find an excuse to travel here, you're all invited to our ribbon cutting ceremony. Just RSVP with me so we know how much food to buy for everybody. We plan on inviting everybody from the President of the United States down to the new DOI Interior um, uh, Secretary of the Interior here, and of course, all the great folks at DOE are always welcome to come to San Pasquale. Um, invitations always open to you. Um, but yeah, and we're going to invite local tribes. Um, the local tribal chair uh, chairpersons will all be invited. As San Pasquale will be the first uh, tribal nation in San Diego County to have a fully operational microgrid. So we want other tribes to see what we've been able to build, accomplish, and hopefully. Um, you know, create something similar that meets your tribal community and needs. Next slide, please. So some lessons learned. Uh, some of these are very similar to, you know, Josh's uh, takes on a RingCon. You know, procurement contracting takes time. It did take a long time, you know, um, when we first got into procurement contracting with, uh, with Green Realities who did this, it took some time to get everything smoothed out. Like I said, utility approvals take time. They just do. I don't know why they do. I mean, SDG&E um, is a big 
you know, big organization and uh, they have a lot of projects going on themselves, like I said, about their fire hardening with the poles, undergrounding, but it just takes a lot of time. So, uh, you know, my, my thing would be however much time you think it's going to take to get approval from your utility, it probably adds three to six months on top of that. Uh, opportunities to leverage funding, we were able to apply and get a grant from Grid Alternatives to help us with our match on this project. I didn't put on this slide, but you know, the total project cost was about $1.5 million, I believe, you know, 50-50 from DOE and then the tribe, but we were able to get about $150,000 from, um, from Grid Alternatives to help with the match. Budget changes, you know, they happen no matter what project you're working, whether it's a microgrid or, you know, putting up, you know, three PVs on a roof, you're going to have budget changes. Definitely seek performance guarantees. This was true before COVID. Um, it's definitely true during COVID uh, because of the cost of everything going up and supply chain issues. So definitely get those performance guarantees. Regular strategic communication. We have a, a weekly standing call every Thursday between myself and the entire team, which includes, you know, Michael Burr from the Microgrid Institute. Uh, you know, Joshua Simmons is always invited and sometimes he graces us with his presence on those calls. And then, of course, our contractors who are building it. So, yeah, we have regular calls. You know, sometimes we have a lot to talk about, sometimes we don't, but it's just a way for us to touch base. And lastly, go fast by going slow. You know, the old adage, uh, measure twice, cut once. Uh, building a microgrid is a big, complex project. You're oftentimes, um, you know, no one's built, I mean, I've never built one of these before. It's the first time I've ever done such a thing. So, you know, take your time. You know, I had a lot of pressure from my business committee and people above me to get this thing turned on as soon as possible. Uh, because, you know, obviously, la you know, the, you, everyone heard about the terrible fires we had here in mostly Northern California. So, unfortunately, we weren't able to get it on for summer and the fire season, the, the, I guess the height of our fire season. But, um, you know, we got to do it right. You know, you can't cut corners. I Don't give in to the pressure by going fast to get a thing turned on because uh, you got to get it right. So, next slide, please. So some of our my pandemic lessons learned, because, of course, I started this project pre-pandemic, then bam, the pandemic hit. So we have some lessons learned. Hopefully, you know, this is the last pandemic. Hopefully, we're almost done with this pandemic, and there won't be another pandemic within any of our lifetimes that we have to deal with such a thing. But, you know, procurement and supply chain issues have become even more challenging during a pandemic. Whether you're building a microgrid or trying to put in some water lines, it just seems harder and harder to get materials. Uh, because of the supply chain issues. Cost of materials have definitely increased. Um, you know, so and this is a project that, you know, even in the best of times, you figure we have a three-year project. And so, you know, we negotiated everything back in, you know, late 2018, 2019, and now it's 2021. So even without the cost of materials rising from a pandemic, they just, you know, the cost of everything eventually goes up, but it's been even more drastic because of the pandemic. Utility approvals have taken very long during the pandemic. And I think part of it also is, um, you know, SDG &E and everywhere, even, uh, and then this kind of goes to the next one, navigating workforce illness, which wasn't really an issue pre-pandemic. Testing, quarantining, people out sick. That's true of San Pasquale. We experienced those issues, right? Testing, people being sick here on the government side, quarantining, so are people out sick. Same true with our contractor who installed the equipment. He had personnel that were being tested, quarantining, out sick. And that's also true of sdg &E, and that could be why it's just taken longer. Um, you know, they only have so many people. They're a big organization. And so, you know, I feel like navigating workforce illness wasn't really an issue pre-pandemic. Definitely was one during this project. And I'm sure it's going to be, if you have a DOE project right now, I'm sure you're experiencing that very same thing. And so due to all that, everything just seems to take longer. We were hoping to have the project, you know, completed six, eight months ago. Uh, we're finally going to be completed here this month, which is great. It's fantastic. Um, took longer than we wanted, but we wanted to get it right. So next slide, please. So some pictures, right? We're, we're pretty much done. So here's our PV panel. This is a picture of underneath our carport. 
their bifacial panel that we installed. Uh, next slide, please. And we did, it's over, this is our employee parking facing the admin building. Uh, you can see the employees are parked underneath it. We did three uh, solar canopies uh, with uh, lighting underneath it because it gets dark. Um, just without, you know, just a benefit of this, right? Without even taking, take the solar out, you know, the equation. Employees love this. They love that they're parking their cars under shade because out here in Southern California, it gets very hot. So it keeps their cars a little bit cooler during hot summer summer times. It keeps them and their cars a little drier when it's raining outside. I know we don't get much rain, but we do every once in a while. And um, so people like that. And um, so, yeah, so it's really nice. And also the lighting, you know, it's daylight savings time here. We set our clocks back in, San in California out here on the reservation. We're very rural, you know, or semi-rural. It's pretty dark uh, around 4.30. It's pretty dark out here now. Most people get off of work between 4.30 and 5.30. So now with the lights on, they're not walking out to a dark, you know, a dark parking lot. Um, so we didn't really have very much lighting in the parking lot previously. Next slide, please. So here's a PV lighting under the canopy. So I took these photos. So you can see that's one canopy with the string of lights off and then with the, another canopy with the string lights on. So that's the middle canopy with the lights off, and that's um, the canopy closest to the admin building with the lights on. Um, and all three canopies can be set with timers so that they can turn the lights on themselves, turn them off. You know, we are in a rural area. We do want to protect the dark night skies out here. So we have our timers right now set to turn on at 4 o'clock and turn off at 6 p.m. It's one, people want to see starry nights. Uh, they want the dark skies. And there are homes around here, so we want to be very conscientious of our neighbors and we're not blasting light pollution at them. But we also want to make it safe for our employees when they're leaving work as well. So that's one thing. If you're going to put a solar canopy with lighting, you might want to take into consideration the hours you turn on your lighting. So our timers are set to go from um, 4 to 6 p.m. And you can see one of our EV charging ports there under the canopy. Next slide, please. So this is PV lighting at night. I know everyone's muted, but can anyone on your computer guess what the problem is with this picture here? Beautiful picture. I wish I could say I took this picture. Unfortunately, it was a neighbor that took this picture and she was complaining about light pollution. So this is what I was talking about, about you know, being conscientious of your surroundings and your neighbors. Um, you know, this was early on when we were testing the lighting. So we had the lighting going on for a full, um, basically from the minute it was dark to the minute the sun came up. So this was lighting going on at about uh, 6 p.m. because this was uh, a couple months ago, <clears throat> 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And our neighbor, she was like, what is going on? It looks like you guys are landing a spaceship down at the tribal hall. Can you please do something about this lighting? But I assured her that it's just a test um, and that we would be resetting the timers. And she's very thankful. She totally understands. From our standpoint, at that employees need you know safe lighting to get into their cars and get home, and so she's happy, we're happy. Um, but this was from a neighbor, so you can see how much light it, it can put off uh, when it's fully active on at nighttime. Next slide, please. Uh, these are our EV charging stations. We installed six, or sorry, three BTC power EV charging stations. There are three units, but six EV charging ports all together, one at the admin building, one at our education building, and one at the tribal hall. <clears throat> uh, you can see that there's a close-up picture when a vehicle is connected, it says it's ready to charge. That side shows that there's an error, so we were doing some testing of what, what the uh, user interface looks like when people connect in. Uh, they're all up and running. Charging is free to all employees and residents because this, as well as the lighting you saw in the last picture, all that lighting and all the power, all the energy to those lights and these charging stations are 100% provided by our uh, our microgrid. So, you know, during the day, you're getting solar, charging the batteries, and then at night, um, if anyone's connected into these, these um, EV chargers or if the lights are on, um, they are getting power from the microgrid. So these are running basically in island mode right now, not really connected to the grid at all. Um, actually, they are not connected to the grid. They're completely 100% island loaded off because we don't have interconnection yet to sdg &E, but we're able to get them up and running because we do have the microgrid up and running. And lastly, 
you know, fill the dreams. If you build it, they will come. We have two employees that have EVs. One, they're both hybrid EVs. They've plugged in when we've hosted meetings from other uh, tribal communities that have come. Uh, they, you know, people have EVs in our community. So we see people already starting to use this, which is really great. Next slide, please. These are our battery storage units that we installed, um, 240 kW. So remember, originally we were looking at 120 uh, due to some efficiencies, and you know we were able to double it and get 240 kW on here. So we're definitely going to meet all of our needs for energy on our microgrid. Um, these can actually be expanded. They're kind of uh, like um, contain like shipping containers. Uh, you know, if you, it's kind of built like that. So inside, you can open these up, and then you can add more rows of batteries if you want. You can add another container <clears throat> and add more batteries. Um, the ballers we put around that was required. One, the tribe wanted that, so it was also required by SDG need for safety. Um, when they're on at night, the, you kind of see these horizontal white lines or, or kind of at a 45 degree, there's LED lights on there. So when they're on at night, the lights turn green. If for some reason they're off, they turn red. So it's a really easy visual to see if the, your battery storage is working. Um, and we're gonna put our tribal logo on these as well. Uh, so yeah, they're quiet. They run fairly quiet. They, you don't really hear them. Out of sight, out of mind. Next slide, please. So SCG &E Transformer was just just installed uh, October 29th. Uh, we built the pad with that little retaining wall. SCG &E pulled the three-phase power and put the transformer in. Uh, I know you're all unmuted, but if you can look, there's one thing we learned uh, that we did, I guess, wrong, but we had a fix. If you look on the, the one to your left without the, um, without the transformer on compared to the one on the right, the bollards are different, if you notice, those two front bollards. We put these in, I didn't realize when we installed these, um, our public work did this, that actually we the two front bollards had to be removable bollards. So I had to take those out and put, you can see where we can, there's a pin in there that we can pop those bollards out. And that's the case SDG &E needs to get in there with a work truck or something like that. So. Uh, that was a lesson learned. You know, I put in a bunch of ballers and I thought they just needed regular ballers and they said no. So that was one thing that we failed at. Um, you know, S Gill caught that and we fixed it. Next slide, please. So that's it for our microgrid. Um, it's been a great project, great learning experience. We've done a lot. The community is very excited about it. The tribal uh, business committee is very excited about it. Um, and uh, we should be completely up and operational by uh, the end of this month and then full PTO probably beginning of 2022 in January. Um, so I want to thank, of course, the DOE for all their help and support on this project, Joshua Simmons and his team, um, my team. <clears throat> uh, like I said, everyone is welcome to come visit us. Just call me. My number is there. My email is there. Come by, visit us. I'll give you a tour. We've already given a tour to uh, a couple of reservations here. Um, Pachanga came out to do a tour of our microgrid. Uh, actually, the city of San Diego is putting in a micro, some microgrids that they got funding for. And some people from the, the city of San Diego government came up to uh, San Pasquale to do a tour of our microgrid. Um, and then uh, the La Jolla Indian Reservation will be coming out here. Uh, December 7th, I believe, for a tour of our microgrid. And you are all welcome to come as well. So thank you very much for your time. I do have one more project I'm going to talk about. Um, this is our San Pasqual. I unfortunately do not have a slide for this because we just got funded for this project. Um, like I said, you know, we're, we're trying to diversify our portfolio and we're trying to do still more residential type solar. But instead of doing individual residential solar projects, we're going to do one large community solar array. So we're going to, we have a ball field and in the ball field, we're going to do carport parking with solar PV. We're going to do 223 kW elevated uh, carport solar PV system. Um, and we're hoping to sign on 80 residential households to participate in this project. And this is going to be a 
monthly energy subscriber fee that they will pay to us to kind of come on to this this um, this PV, and we're looking at designing it kind of like a co-op. So people will come on, they'll subscribe, my department will administer it, and we might have people do certain jobs, uh, you know, every quarter, whether that's, you know, maybe trimming the weeds around the solar or, you know, helping clean the solar panels, um, you know, stuff like that, like some, kind of like a co-op sort of thing. Uh, so it's a, it's a great project. We're really excited to get funded for it. Um, we're hoping to distribute 94% of the energy created to our 80 tribal member subscribers. We're toying around with about a $36 monthly fee uh, that individuals would pay, um, and that would just help pay for the long-term O&M and maintenance of, of the, the system. Um, I don't have much to say because we just started the project, actually. We just, um, just started it last month. Right now, we're still early in the project in the sense that we're still trying to gather, uh, get the homeowner signed up and onboarded and getting their energy, uh, you know, getting their energy needs by getting their green button data from sdg &E. And we're hoping to offset, you know, each homeowner by as much as 50% of their e electric bill uh, by coming on to this uh, community solar project that we're doing. Uh, you know, electric bill out here can easily run $1,000 a month during the summertime when people are, 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 you know, running their AC. And we're also trying to get a good um, mix of representatives. So we're trying to get you know, people with, you know, a large family, five, six people in a family, or, you know, tribal elders where there's only two people. Our housing stock is very, very, it's, it's varied here. We go from, you know, stick-built homes to prefab homes to older trailers, homes that are all electric, homes that are a mix of electric and propane out here, homes that aren't very energy efficient. So that's why we're trying to get their data so we can, you know, uh, properly size everything correctly in terms of how much energy their needs are. And then each ho each homeowner that comes on will be given a, a distribution of what this generates going forward. And uh, if there's any excess, uh, you know, we do plan on taking some of that energy and pushing it to a tribal government building. And the way we're going to do this is not behind everyone's meter. We're going to do a NIM V, a NIM virtual generation. So all the homeowners will come onto our system, the system will generate energy, and then we'll just simply work with SDG and E to distribute a percentage of that energy to each account. So if let's say, you know, you came on and your energy needs were, you know, or let's say you had we would we would then shuffle like say fifty percent of what's per, uh, generated to each account going forward. Um, so it's an exciting project. It's going to allow us to knock out a lot of homes at once, you know, because we're going to get 80 homes. Uh, so it'll almost double the amount of people that are on or uh, have renewable energy. So I don't have much to say about it right now. Next year, I should have a pretty good slide up because we're hoping to start construction um, by March of 2022 on this project. Um, so hopefully next year, I'll have a little bit some more exciting stuff to say and slides about this. But uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Excellent. Thanks, John, and thank you both for your time and uh, willingness to share these projects with everyone. Uh, it's exciting to uh, see and hear about the pro progress that's been made on these projects and uh, also anticipating the movement on the new project as well. I know I'm looking forward to seeing where these are at when we all get together again for the uh, 2022 program review. Uh, next, I'm going to pass the mic to James Jensen, who will moderate the Q&A session. James is a contractor to the Office of Indian Energy, and in addition to being a project monitor on some of your projects, uh, he also has been instrumental in bringing you our monthly webinars for many years. Uh, James, the mic's all yours. Thanks so much, Josh. Uh, gosh, these are two or well, four excellent projects, but but two excellent presentations, just a ton of information in there. Um, so thank you, thank you both. Um, the question I have is is for both of you, um, and 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 specific to the microgrid projects, not the, the not the community solar. Um, uh, are are these facilities going to operate uh, islanded from the grid, 
And uh, if so, is there any opportunity to uh, uh, sell power back to SDG&E when market conditions are, are right? Um, you know, when SDG&E is looking for, for, for energy and spot prices or whatever are high? Uh, so this is Josh Simmons. Um, all all systems, including San Pasquale's microgrids, are are actually grid connected. So they are on net metering. <clears throat> well, I, I don't, the Rincon Harris one, we may try to do a non-export um, situation, but it's still they'll they're all behind the meter, grid connected, that are connected to the grid during, when there isn't an outage, and they all go into island mode when there is an outage. Uh, so I guess in a sense, they are all set up through net metering to export to the grid. Okay. So they'll just be, it'll just be kind of traditional net metering uh, where excess power just flows back onto the grid and it has some flat rate of value. Yes. Okay. Interesting. Um, uh, Another question here for, for the Rincon specific project. So there's three different battery technologies, there's storage technologies, I should say. Um, it sounds like they're, they're selected mainly, uh, or at least a couple of them were selected primarily due to the availability of, of funding to, <laughs> to, to, to install them probably, um, or at least partially incentivized by availability of funding. Um, is there any, uh, do, do they have kind of separate roles uh, in the grid? In the operating the microgrid, or are they kind of interchangeable? Um, uh, uh, yeah, they definitely do have separate roles in the microgrid. So the lithium ion uh, is really the only one capable of supporting a seamless transition, or, or uh, allowing the uh, supporting the transition into island mode. Uh, so the flywheel technology is is not capable of even black starting. Um, the flow battery, I believe, is capable of black starting, but just cannot cannot respond quickly enough to do so. So the the lithium ion is really it's kind of not sole purpose, but its primary purpose is is to to support that 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 transition. And then uh, the the flow and the flywheel energy storage systems, you know, that is accurate. You know, that was it was partially, you know, they are part of the system due to the availability of the CEC grant opportunity, but also we saw that as an opportunity that the load at Harrah's in that, that that entire resort area is substantial and there is a need for greater energy storage for both resiliency and economic purposes. So it just was kind of a good opportunity, a good match for us to pursue those. Uh, but the lithium ion, we're actually seeking, so right now we have a 4.5 megawatt one hour battery and we're exploring opportunities for a shorter duration because we really only need probably even a 15 minute battery but it's just not it's not we're, we're trying to find if there is a cost effective solution out there uh and the epc right now is actually kind of saying that they're they're they think that the only kind of cost effective solution may end up being a a two hour battery at four and a half megawatts so that's you know kind of an ongoing conversation we have fixed sizing for the the flow and the flywheel systems as a result of the grant and, and they, you know, they're they're really for kind of the energy arbitrage, demand reduction, demand charge, uh, uh, peak shaving, and and just to have that storage available for those outages. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the, the one of the variables we're working on right now is the the sizing of the lithium ion. Great. And then a follow up question: uh, uh, What complicated microgrid and multiple storage options and that sort of thing is? How uh, challenging or, or what sort of involvement um, will the, the tribe have in, in like operating the grid, um, the microgrid? Are, is, it, is it easily controlled with, with simple HMI interface or is it, uh, do you need to like hire um, you know, a programmer to, to, <laughs> to change how it's operated? Um, well, uh, you know, I think that some of that's to be determined. We have not gotten to the stage where we're selecting the microgrid controls uh, solution or solution vendor. Um, so some of that's to be, yeah, some of it's to be determined. We're anticipating having to have an ongoing operation and maintenance 
uh, contract with EPC or some other group that will uh, provide remote support and you know res respond to the extent that there need there's issues that need to be resolved. We're anticipating that there is going to be some level of on-site uh, kind of monitoring and, uh, and inputs that's going to have to be a part of the existing team, and whether that's a new kind of full-time person or, or kind of added to somebody's role is, is to be determined, uh, but is actually something that came up, has come up more recently um, in, our, in some of our conversations. Great. Uh, that's all we have for questions. So uh, a really cool project, but uh, uh, I personally could ask you questions all day, but we're, we're running tight on time anyway. So let's uh, pass it back to Josh to close this out. Great, thank you, James. And thanks again to our presenters, Josh Simmons and John Flores, some really great projects there. Thanks for sharing. So this concludes session seven of the program review. Uh, the presentations will be posted in a few days and the recording will be available within the, in the next week or two. Uh, if you're attending the next session, you'll need to join using the link and call-in number provided in the calendar invitation you received when you registered for that session. Thanks everyone, goodbye. Thanks, everybody.